If you or someone you love is a part of a student organization on a college campus or community college and are always looking for new ways to fundraise, this is the episode for you or them. So stay tuned. It's after the music. You're about to listen to a great episode of the Laz and Be Experienced podcast. Within this episode, my hope is that you obtain something that will help you find your success. So grab a pen, get your paper, your favorite snack or drink, and really listen to what I have to say. I truly believe it can be what you need to get you to your next level in life. So grab a seat and enjoy the ride. And I'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to another episode of the Laz and B Experience podcast. Thank you for tuning in. This is definitely going to be a great episode to tune in to, especially if you are a college student and you are you you're in a student organization. Because if you couldn't tell by the title of this episode, I will be going over student organization fundraising or fundraising for your student organization now i know this episode is going to be geared mostly if not all to students who are in college but do not fret i don't know why i use fret but anyway i will throughout the season will be more than just i will be talking more i will be talking more about other subjects outside of college it's just that college is part of my life right now and it's something that i have a lot of a lot of knowledge that can help others so um for those who are not in college or graduated college i will have other episodes that are for you so if this episode is not for you or you are past that level of college share this episode with somebody who's not whether it's a sibling that's in college or a friend that's still in college or somebody you know be a be a a great listener a great um person and share this episode with them because this will definitely bless them and help them be successful when it comes to fundraising for their student organization and that doesn't have to be if they're just a leader of that organization which it'd be great if they are but if they're if they are a member and don't have any leadership bro this can definitely help as well so let's get started with this episode and like all my individual episodes and i say individual episodes because as you may know this season i will be having guests for the first time which i'm super excited about and based off this episode you probably heard at least two people two of my guests so i will have more to come um throughout this season so for my individual episodes where i do not have a guest i will be having a story time so with this episode let's start off with a story time so as the president of my nesby national society of black engineers chapter at my first school at northern illinois university or niu we were able to come up with a lot of different ways to help fundraise or raise money for our chapter we raise money throughout the, the school year for the following reasons so one to attend our conferences at low cost for our our active members and i say low cost because they did have to put in a little bit because they have to like want to go and and be active in that in that way in in that way or that one way but also active in like attending me i say active members because they have to be the ones who actually attend meetings and help with all these these different types of fundraisers i'm going to be talking about today um who helped with volunteer activities and that kind of thing because this is a privilege this is not a right for students to be able to go to these conferences so having um having only active members be able to attend these conferences uh, was a goal of ours uh, we were also able to buy t-shirts and or polos to look unified when participating in volunteering events or to wear for the first day of our NASB conferences or to show pride for our chapter wherever we go. 
Uh, so having these chapter shirts and polos when I was there was definitely something that I really enjoyed um, having for our members. And there was actually one year where it was probably a bad decision, but I bought these white hats because we had a little bit of money left over. And I don't know why I got them white because that's like the worst color to get because they get dirty very quickly. But that is a learning lesson that I got and hopefully pass on to you. So don't get white hats. Um, also, uh, with the money that we raised throughout the year, we wanted to buy, provide snacks like pizza and drinks and chips and candy and that kind of thing for our chapter meetings. And as you know, as college students, that is one way to help get more members to actually come to your meetings is by having some kind of free food. Um, that's actually what attracted me, or I will say that's one of the reasons that attracted me to come to my first Nesby meeting at my first school. Um, so having, being able to do that was definitely good. And then lastly, being able to host an end of the year banquet, I think if I'm not mistaken, at least to my knowledge, when I was chapter president at my first school, uh, was the first time when we had a, an end of the year banquet, um, and being able to have that to showcase our seniors and send them off to their careers on a high note to celebrate our members who have been working hard throughout the school year as students in as our members to just celebrate us for being students and making it past another year of college and having guest speakers, whether they are like Nesby people or alumni, whether they're people or executives from our university or just alumni from our chapter, having those people come back and see what we have done so they can want to give for the following year. So that was great to, to be able to host those. One of our biggest chapter fundraisers that we started at my old school was our weekly pizza sales we had at our College of Engineering building. So we sold different types of pizza. We had soda, we had water. I don't know if we had chips, but we had those basic things. And then the College of Engineering was so far away from other places to eat that this gave the students a quick way to grab some food or grab a snack in between classes. We got so popular that we end up having like like lines of students wanting to get get food um, from us or snacks from us and they would get mad if we missed a week because they're really counting on us to be there for that day because they knew that we're, we're we were very consistent the only times we missed were really like maybe if we was going on a conference or something for that week we also got so popular that other engineering um, organizations tried to copy us and they had their own sales for for the week. So it wouldn't be, of course, it wouldn't be on the same day or anything like that, but they will have their own sales. Uh, most people, I don't think they did pieces. They try other things. And honestly, they not to be biased or no shade to them or anything, but our chapter probably did the best at it because one, we were the most consistent at it um and then two we had our dedicated and trustworthy men members to be there every week so that really gave us a a leg up when trying to do these sales that we did and i was very proud of our chapter members and if i'm not mistaken it was my vice president who came up with that or either either my vice president or our advisor who came up with the idea and our advisor was the reason why we even got the pizza at a discount because that really helped with the profits of the pizza and the drinks and all that kind of stuff so it was a great all-around effort from our chapter members and leadership and advisor now that I got that out the way and we can get into why you tuned into this episode in the first place. And if I was you, I would definitely grab, like I said earlier, grab some pen, grab a pen, grab some pen, grab a pen and some paper because this is about to be some great information for students looking to fundraise for their student organization. 
a lot of the stuff we have i have tried in the past as well so it's not just based off what i think is good ideas but actually what uh worked for me when i was doing fundraising or when i was a part of all of the leadership team and figuring out different ways to fundraise so with the main topic uh before i get into i have five ways to raise money of to fundraise for your student organization i have three things that your organization has to have in order to have a better chance of being successful at any of these ideas so the first thing you in your student organization must have is a reason to raise money. This helps when trying to so solicit from others. I will get into that a little later, as well as help your team have goals for them to reach. Um, having that reason why, just like in your personal life, having that reason why will help you when times get tough or you think things are not working well, you figure you, you're able to see what you're doing it for. And then creating a, a sponsorship package that explains everything your organization does, the goals that your organization have, whether it be financial, academic, because you are a student organization, membership wise, etc. And anything else you believe could convince people to give to your student organization. So sponsorship package is a great thing for student organizations to have when trying to solicit to maybe companies that come talk to your student organization or alumni that graduated and who was a part of your organization when they're students. Uh, so definitely have that available. You should have it updated. I would say every year, but at the least every other year to have the most updated information as far as like who's in leadership positions, um, pictures to showcase the different things that you your organization does throughout the year uh, different descriptions of different things you guys do and that kind of thing and then if you need help creating a sponsorship package you can simply do a google search of examples of sponsorship packages uh, you can ask your advisor. They should have ideas of what a, a sponsorship package is and what goes inside of it and how it looks. You can even go and ask people who raise money for your school or your your uh, university, your your university or your specific college. So someone who raised money for for me, example, will be college the College of Engineering. They have people who specifically who are there to raise money for the college. And then also people within the university who are there to raise money for the university. So I would definitely try to, if you can contact them, I would definitely email them. Or if you want to, you can also email me at the last me experience at gmail.com. If you need any examples or help creating one, I probably still have examples from my other school, my first school NIU when we had um i'm pretty sure they still have have an updated sponsorship package too uh, but i'm pretty sure i have somewhere in my computer on my hard drive um examples of our sponsorship package so, so don't be, don't be afraid to reach out to me for help too so that's number one you need to have a reason why you're raising the money number two you need to have goal have a goal amount you want to raise so, so this should come from a budget your organization creates for the year with everything you want to accomplish in line items for everything you need to accomplish it so if you know you want to have pizza at every meeting that you have for the school year or for the semester you should know exactly how many meetings you're going to have. So if you meet every week, you know, there's 16 weeks in the semester. So, you know, you need pizza for 16 weeks. Or if you have it every other week, you know, you need pizza for eight weeks. So if you have your meeting every other week and, you know, pizza costs, I don't know, let's just say twenty five dollars. So twenty five times eight, which is what? $200 so you know you need to have that amount let me double check my cap 
calculator because I don't want to get y'all real numbers even though it's just an example. Yes, I am an engineer and I do know how to do math. So yes, two hundred dollars. You need to know. You know. You know. You need to have two hundred dollars on your line item for pizza or snacks for your, um, for your meetings, and then you do that for everything you need for that year, and that's how you figure out how uh, the amount of money you need to raise or how much money you need uh, for that year. This also helps your team to know what they need to accomplish and gives them something to aim for. So again, if you are a part of your student organization, student organizations, leadership, the treasurer and the finance chair and the president and the vice president, all those people should be coming together to work on this. It doesn't have to be just one person. Teamwork makes the dream work. So definitely use your team in order to get this uh, accomplished. And then the last thing you need um, to do any of these ideas that I'm going to give today is you need to have dedicated and trustworthy members and leaders because you are a student first. You need to you need help from other members and leaders to accomplish your uh, fundraising goals. So it can't be just one person who's doing all the fundraising. Of course, it can be one person who's the head of the fundraising, but that shouldn't be the only person who's doing things. That is also another way for your members to be active members. And you should have different perks for your active members versus non-active members. So like I was saying with my student organization within my story time, we had polos and we had t-shirts. Only people who got polos and t-shirts were, we also had chapter dues. So people who paid their chapter dues, students who paid their chapter dues, as well as students who were active. So they were part of our fundraising. They were part of volunteering. They helped, they came to our meetings and that kind of thing. So you definitely need dedicated and trustworthy members you don't need anybody who's going to lie about anything or not show up or steal or all that kind of stuff because that's all is going to be detrimental to your success if you have so make sure you have our uh, just summarize one make sure you have a reason you're raising money Two, make sure you have a goal amount you want to raise and number three make sure you have dedicated members and leaders that are going to go out and do the work. If you have those three things, you will be able to accomplish any of these five fundraising ideas that I have. So let's get into those ideas. The reason why you are listening to this episode in the first place. So number one, the first fundraising I, fundraiser idea I have is fundraising with local restaurants in stores. In most cases, your student organization must be a 501c3 nonprofit organization in order for to do this type of fundraiser. If you are a student chapter of a large organization like Nesby, like I am, you could check with your larger organization on their website to check about their non um, nonprofit status. It, um, I don't know exactly steps of becoming a registered nonprofit, but if you are interested, I would definitely talk to someone from the legal department within your school to see if that's even a possibility for your um, student organization to register as a uh, nonprofit. I'm not a legal expert. I'm not a lawyer or nothing like that. So I can't give any advice like that, nor do I know the exact advice. So. I know for us, we were Nesby is a nonprofit organization. So as a chapter, we fall under that. And then also double check with restaurants or stores you're interested in um, in doing this type of fundraising with to see if they if you need to be a, a registered nonprofit. Like I said, I think most cases you need to be, but there's no um, reason you shouldn't ask because you never know. Now this is generally gener gener I can't even say the word. This is generally generally, geez, how this type of fun ways it works, and it can works work in two different ways. So, the establishment, so the restaurant or the store, would give you a date, 
in in between a certain window so maybe for two to five hours anyone who buys something at a buy something or buy a certain item so these these are specifics with that with that restaurant or with that store um anyone who buys something or buy a specific item from them they would donate a certain percentage to your organization um so no matter who who that person is they don't have to know your organization they don't have sometimes they don't even have to know that the, you're doing a fundraiser there as long as they order something between those on that day in between those hours you would get a percentage of from that item or from um from those sales that's one way and the second way um the other way is similar except for the or organization for the organization gets any donations the customer will have to bring in a slip or mention your organization during that window of time so in one case the organization doesn't have to be mentioned they just have to go and, and purchase whatever and then in the second way they do have to be mentioned or have some type of flyer saying i want to support this organization and that's all really what they the customer will have to do they don't have to like pay anything extra or anything like that now this fundraiser will take a lot of planning with the restaurant in ever advertising for people to go during your time period so you want to make sure that you get as many people as you can through to come to that restaurant at that time because i mean it's good for the company because now you're advertising for people to come to that restaurant um and they're on their end going to donate a certain percentage sometimes it's maybe like 10 percent or 15 percent or something like that but every percentage count or every dollar counts so is definitely a good fundraiser for you to participate in and then with this fundraiser you can kind of kill two birds with one stone so during the time of the fundraiser you can plan an outing for your organization to go there and spend time together outside of school so you can spend have some time where you're not worried about school you're not worried about homework or tests or anything you're just out there with other members enjoying your time, also raising money for your student organization. Now the restaurant and the store that participate in these types of, of fundraisers can be a mixture of local and national brands and can take, uh, like I said, take a lot of planning. So do your research by checking their website, give that particular, that specific restaurant or store a call and or going to the physical location and asking for details about uh, fundraising. So definitely uh, reach out to those restaurants, reach out to all the restaurants within your area because not everybody does it. And I mean, some people might do it on a more uh, first come first serve basis because they don't they can't do it for everybody. So you definitely want to plan this out and make sure you get to them. Be one of the first ones of the school year to do it. So that's one way you can fundraise. And I believe we done this once or twice. I'm not exactly sure how much we raised, but it's an easy way to fundraise. You just got to do the planning for it. And like I said, it can be double as a an outing for your student organization. So that's number one. Let's get into number two. This one is what I talked about during my story time. So hosting food or item sales. So before you do this, you want to make sure you are allowed to sell items at your university. So some schools, you might not be able to sell items and some in, or you might not be able to sell at specific locations or times. So that's one of the first things we have to do, make sure was go to our college of engineering and make sure we can sell pizza in the first place. And some places you might have to fill out forms or sign up for, I mean, most places you will have to sign up for it. Uh, some places you might have to get like a permit or something to actually sell items to. So definitely before you go out there and just put a table on your school at your school uh, student center or outside somewhere, make sure you can actually do it because you could get your student organization in trouble if you're not allowed or if you have to fill out paperwork before you do it. 
if you are allowed, most likely you will have to, like I said, fill out uh, forms and have some type of idea of what you're going to sell. When trying to figure out what to sell, find something you know students will buy and at a price you can sell it at to make a profit. So it's not just about finding a good item or, or just selling anything, about selling something that students at your university will buy because that uh, is most of the population you'll be selling to and make sure you're selling it at a uh, high enough price price where you're making a profit so making sure that whatever price you paid your pay for the item you're selling it for more money so you can make the profit from it so like i said at the beginning we sold pizza because we knew students at our engineering building needed something quick they can eat in between classes uh, before you even f uh, fill out any forms or host a sale, you should know the item, how much it costs you, how much you're going to sell it for, and how much you can potentially make in a profit. So outside of pizza sales, if you want to sell candy or you want to sell, um, I don't know, anything else, you just got to make sure that it's, a, like I said, something that people want to buy and something that you can actually upsell so you can make a profit. Now, if you get, if you decide now that you have an item that you want to sell, you have to get, you have to decide on the location. So you want to pick somewhere where you know there will be walking traffic, a lot of walking traffic. Um, like for us, we chose the College of Engineering because we knew all the students were had all the college of engineering students had to be at the college of engineering. And like I said, we were far away from any other kind of food option. So we were kind of like, I won't say the only choice, but we were the closest choice for them to choose from. Uh, so if you get to choose a location, definitely try to click up, pick a location where, you know, a, a lot of students will be, um, will be walking. If you get to select the time, make sure it's a time where there will be a lot of walking traffic. So definitely choose not just a time, but a date where, you know, there are a lot of classes during this day, usually at the beginning or in the middle of the week. Fridays are usually the least amount of of classes, and especially throughout the school year. That's probably the day that a lot of people stop going to that a class if it's like monday wednesday friday friday is most likely the day that they will not go if they don't go to a class we usually so like i said we usually sold around noon because that's usually when people were hungry and looking for food so if it's if you know a lot of classes are at noon to if you can select noon if you know a lot of classes are at, and you get a, a time you get a a a range of time so it's not hopefully i mean it might be an hour so choose the best hour if it's two hours choose the the best two hours if it's three hours choose the best three hours or so uh but we usually i think we had it for i mean once we start had a roll with it like we only needed maybe an hour and a half to maybe two hours um and we pretty much sold out of everything so depending on um, the traffic and the, that type of item, you might not even need a lot of time too. As soon as you get confirmation of the location, the date and the time, you should be advertising everywhere you can, especially at and near the location you'll be selling at. So as soon as you turn in your paperwork and get it approved for you to sell your item on your date or at your time, you need to be having flyers. You need to be having word of mouth. You need to be having social. Now that we have social media, uh, we've been have social media, but now you can use social media as well because a lot of stu student organizations have their own social media. So definitely like pub and put it out. And it, again, it just shouldn't be the one person who's in charge of everything. It should be every member who is a part of the student organization, because again, for our student organization, for them to participate in the fun activities, they also have to participate in the, the supporting activities. And this is one of those supporting activities. 
uh, this give people time to know exactly the item you're going to sell and for them to get their money prepared. Make sure you know exactly who was going. Also, make sure exactly who, know exactly who's going to be helping and when they're going to be there. This comes back to that trustworthy and dedicated members, because if you have nobody there, you can't sell anything. If you must make shifts so people don't have to necessarily be there and stay the whole time, especially if they have class during that time of sale. So maybe some people can only stay 30 minutes. Maybe some people can only stay an hour. Uh, make sure you have a list and know exactly who's going to be there at what time. So people can get to class when they need to get to class or get to other things that, when they need to get there and still be able to support. Lastly, again, you can kill two birds with one stone by advertising upcoming events in or meetings you would like to invite more students so they can also become members so as you're selling items at whatever location you're selling items at you can also have flyers like thank you for supporting us if you want to be a part of us be one of us one of us one of us i don't know what what is that from i don't know i thought that was funny but anyway um if you if they if you want to also get people to be a part of your organization have flyers for your next meeting have flyers for your next event um so they can be like okay you guys if they think your item that you're selling is is good or cool they might actually want to be a part of your organization again this will require a lot of planning ahead of time to make sure you have events and meetings to actually advertise. You can't just be like, come to one of our meetings and be like, oh, when is your meeting? And like, oh, we haven't decided that yet. But I mean, if that is the case, you can also encourage people to follow your organization on social media to get the latest updates on events and meetings. So maybe you don't have the most updated list of events that's gonna happen, but you want people to wanna be a part of your organization, definitely have a social media, have an active social media, because if they decide to join your social media or follow you on social media, but you don't use your social media, then that means nothing, nothing's gonna come of it. So one, make sure you do have activities and events ready before the fundraiser. And two, make sure you have an active social media so they can follow your social media. So that is number two, second way of raising money. Let's get into number three, which is raffles in or tournaments. Now this is very similar to number two, except you don't necessarily need to have a table, but you can if you want to use it to like to sell tickets for the raffle or for the tournament. Uh, you can also check with your school. You should also should not could you should also check with your school to make sure you can do this and to fill out any necessary forms because just because you can sell items at your school doesn't mean you can have raffles or tournaments at your school. So definitely make sure this is something you can do at your school. And if it's not something you can do at your school and you have students within your organization who live off campus, maybe you can do it at their their apartment or at their house or whatever. Now with the raffle, you can buy um, inexpensive tickets or if you know someone within your organization is creative, they can design tickets, just make sure they're unique enough where someone just can make copies of it and have a whole bunch of copies or make sure it's like something you tear off so you keep one half and they keep one half and um they only get the other half if they if they actually buy it they can't just create it and tear it off and give it to you they actually have to make the money exchange with it uh, everyone in your organization should be again encouraged to sell a certain number of tickets and advertise any and everywhere they go now the risk with raffles is finding an item that is good enough that people will buy tickets to try and win, but not too expensive where you don't make a profit unless of course you can get something or someone, some company donates an item to you. So you definitely want to find something. I mean, it can be cash too. You can say the, the money, the, the prize is cash, but 
again with that risk is you got to make sure that the cash is not too high where you're cutting into profits or losing money uh, but it's also big enough where people actually want to try to win it so you can't say you can win ten dollars off this raffle but the the tickets are five dollars like is no reason for them to do it so definitely um, look into how you can make this work for you if this is something that you want to do now with tournaments now this is a good way to get people interested in your organization as well as raise money again make sure i'm going to say this every time make sure you're allowed to do this at your school and fill out any necessary paperwork and reserve the rooms you will need again if you are not allowed to do this or if you find to find it better to do it at someone's apartment definitely make sure they can also do it at their apartment because they are renting someone up they are renting and they have rules that they have to follow so make sure that they are not breaking any rules to get them kicked out of their apartment complex so definitely again plan ahead a time and make sure you have all that um, information done before you start um, the tournament or advertising for it uh, I would say try to make try to find something you know people like to do and require minimum amount of room so if you want to do a basketball tournament which is totally fine to do you just got to make sure you have a location to do that and with those kind of tournaments you probably have a minimum amount of room or space to do it um, again it's not a bad thing to do you just have to plan a lot in advance where if you do maybe like a video game tournament if you have members within your organization that has video games or have video games that people enjoy playing mostly like 2k or madden or call of duty those type of games you will most likely have a lot of people that want to play if you have people with those systems with those games and potentially with those with a tv um you can host a tournament and get people to um participate in the tournament that way again the more room you need the harder it will be to find a location like I said, video game tournaments are great because depending on how many people you sign up, you might only need one to two classroom size rooms. It can be, it can have multiple games going on at once, even in a smaller area. So if you are allowed to do a tournament at your school and you are able to reserve a classroom or a meeting room or something like that, you can have two possibly two TVs going on at once where you can have 2K on one TV and have Madden on another TV or have a PS5, I think PS5 is out now, you know, PS5 and uh, the Xbox, whatever the new Xbox is. Um, you can have that going on at the same time. And then sometimes your student, your school might have those things available for you as a student organization to rent either at a low cost or a um even free so definitely again reach out to your stu your student organization your student government um to make sure one you're allowed to do this and two if they have any um anything any systems or games or tvs you can use for for free now Again, the risk with tournaments is having a prize. Usually I would say money, but any prize big enough for people to want to enter, but also small enough where again, your organization makes a profit because the whole reason for any of these ideas, the whole reason for a tournament for a raffle is for your organization to raise money. So you want to make sure you make room for, for profit. Uh, you could also try and sell snacks to raise more money or even make it included within the tournament to get more people to sign up. So you can have you can sell items to people who are just there as spectators. And then you can say people who enter the tournament, which are people who paid to be there, can get maybe a free bag of chips or a free juice or whatever for signing up. Um, I did not include any pricing or suggest any type of pricing for the raffle or the tournament because it really depends on 
so many factors you and your organization would have to decide so i don't know exactly what you should be pricing things at i can't remember what we priced our pizza at and our chips and oh, i don't think we had chips but our pizza and our, our drinks at um but definitely you have to look at how, again look at how much you you exp, you want to make from the the tournament or the raffle see how much money it costs to get the item that that can win that people can win from the raffle or the tournament and then figure out how many people you expect to actually enter the tournament or the raffle and then you can figure out how much profit you can potentially make those are three of the five I, uh, ideas that I think are great, especially for student organizations to do. Now let's get into number four, which is university and or college grants. So when I say university, I mean your whole school. When I say college, I mean your specific college. So if you're an engineering student, college of engineering, if you're a business student, college of business, so that kind of thing. So at your school, part of your tuition, at least at most schools, I would say part of your tuition is used for student organizations. Um, if that's the case for your school, you will most likely have a have to present some type of presentation to your student or uh, student government or to your college as to how much you need, the purpose for the money, the dates, anything else that you would need to decide for them to decide on whether they should give you give your student organization money and how much now when i was at northern illinois university this is how we got a bulk of our money that we needed to go to conferences and for our different events that we did so um we had to present in front of of the student government as well as i think some advisors of the student government and we gave a simple maybe 10 minute presentation they asked questions we gave them i don't think we gave them a sponsorship package we gave them our like budget basically with all our numbers on it and again if you have to give a presentation but you're nervous about giving a presentation the episode before this one the first the second individual episode i, I did this season is about giving speeches and presentations so go back and listen to that if you need help with giving a presentation uh, so definitely make sure you have all your numbers in place you sh can do this over the summer because usually these type of meetings happen at the beginning of the school year because they're trying to figure out who's going to get how much throughout the semester so definitely be prepared for that now just because you say and have a budget that says you need X amount of money doesn't mean they will grant you the whole amount. Sometimes they want organizations to also put in some effort in order to raise money for the organization. So uh, this is not one of the ways that, that I'm that I put down for today, but for my student organization, we also had chapter due. So um, I think it was like $10 a semester. So $20 for the whole year you are considered a member of the chapter and again that came with perks of uh, potentially being able to go to conference for a discount having the opportunity to get uh shirts and polos and that kind of thing and then also to participate in our end of the year banquet so definitely if you do decide to give chapter dues which i'm not saying is a bad thing make sure they are getting something for it and it's not just about coming to the meetings because if that's the case anybody can come to the meeting and if you're saying people can't come to the meeting because they have to pay their chapter dues you're not going to have a lot of members so you need to have that that benefit more than just being able to be a part of the meetings that you guys have but going back to number four of, of grants from your university or college so your student government or college should also have um, advertisement or at least someone you can go to to ask questions and get everything you need. So even at my current school, at IPUI, um, we have to present. It's not the same kind of way 
as at NIU. Um, this is, I mean, I think you should definitely do it as early as possible, but it's, I don't think they have, well, I think they do have a deadline. I didn't do a, a lot of the fundraising here at IEPUI as, as much as I did for NIU. Um, but I do know there are different um, departments that you can go and get funding from for different things. So I know some departments at IEPUI, you went for funding to go to conferences and their funding was specific. For, I can't even say the word specifically for student organizations to go to the conferences and then some other grants are for other reasons. So definitely go to those people who, who give out those grants. And if you don't know who those people are, go start off with your student government and then go to your advisor, go to past members. They should know um, those people will, should be definitely helpful to figure out who to go to when trying to get uh, grants from your school. This is also, I did say, I mean, you can also have your sponsorship package ready for them as well. Uh, but like I said, sponsorship package is more for soliciting outside of the college, um, like companies and alumni, but you can definitely use it as a reference when needed um, for this as well. And then make sure, like I said, for all the other ideas make sure you plan and prepare for this because usually like i said they have certain amount of money they can allocate for each year and if you miss the deadline the, your organization might not be able to get any funds for the year so definitely reach out to student government reach out to student activities reach out to anybody who's in charge of student organizations at your school and figure out where you can go to get f funding because they like, like i said some schools if not all schools have part of their tuition going towards student organizations to give money for student organizations and some departments within your school have uh budgets for stu student organizations so again 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 this is not the job of just one person within your student or organization to go out and figure out this should be something that everyone within your student organization especially the leadership should go out and do this and be a team teamwork makes the dream work i think i said this early in in the podcast but my my football coach in high school used to say this all the time and it's definitely something uh, I use in my everyday life, especially with leadership. Moving on to my last way that you can raise money for your school, which is alumni donations. One important thing that your organization should do is get and keep contact information from your alumni who were part, who were a part of your organization who are active members of your organization, I should say, before they graduate. So you should get not their school email because they're not gonna look at that anymore. Get their phone number, get their personal email. If they have a job already, get their job email if they have it. Um, get the information that you can use in the future, not just for that year, but for years in the future as well. Um, these people can be, uh, people who give back for donations, people who can be guest speakers at your meetings or your entity, your banquet. Um, and then they can possibly help you and your members also be employed or get hired at their company. So keeping their contact information is ju not just about getting donations, which is definitely, um, a part of it but it's also about them also wanting hopefully wanting to give back to organization they they were a part of when they were in college and yes we all know they will probably already get solicited from their school to donate um or from their college to donate but hopefully most people are more willing to give directly to a student organization they were actively involved in to then to the school at large because a lot of people have to take out student loans for to attend school 
and they probably rather give again give directly to you guys as the student organization than to give to the student the the school at large because you don't know where that money is gonna go where if they give to you personally or not personally but give to your organization personally um they know exactly the things that you guys do because they were a part of your organization when they were students and then like i said if your student organization is a 501c3 nonprofit organization they could potentially write it off on their taxes again i'm not a legal expert i'm not a lawyer so don't go to me for that information go to your lawyer for that information or to your accountant for this case in many if not all of the other ones i talked about today you want to make sure you have a bank account specific specifically for your school organization where only certain people will have access to so this is very important that you have as well because after you get all this money after you get all these thousands these millions of course it, it probably won't be millions but after you get all this money for your student organization you want to have it in a place that is safe um uh, which is a bank account and once you should definitely be, you should be able to especially at banks that maybe partner with your school or close uh as far as location to your school you should be able to create a student organization bank account and you should have probably the president i would say the president the vice president treasurer and then your faculty advisor or whoever your advisor is be the people who can get access to that account and i will also make it where maybe not you will have to have more than one person get uh get something approved before they can gr get anything from um the account and that's something you can set up with the bank so after all of this um and all of this donation talk and all of this fundraising talk definitely make sure you have somewhere to keep the money uh, this is also a great reason to always have an updated uh, sponsorship package when I, I'm referring to um, the alumni donation because it's not specifically for the alumni I mean it could be for the alumni especially the ones who maybe graduated 15 years ago and they still want to give back to the organization they was a part of when they were in college uh, but it's also great about um, Another great thing about alumni is if they work for a company that has a line item in their budget to donate money every year, they can help you help your student organization talk to the right person at their company so your organization can be a part of that donation money. Now, a lot of um, companies, I mean, they, they do want to give money, or not, I won't say give money, they do want to donate money as well. Uh, especially to if they can to 501c3 501c3 nonprofits and they usually do that at the beginning slash end of their fiscal year and a lot of companies have their fiscal year in in like june or july so that will be that's when they make a lot of financial decisions for the next year or the next fiscal year so being able to talk to and send your sponsorship package to someone before that will be great will be the best uh for you so this could be something that you send at the end of your school year to start your fundraising for the next year like i said this will most likely require your student organization to be a registered not 501c 501 c3 nonprofit organization so definitely make sure you are one um and if you're not one see if you can register to be one and those are my ways i think can help you fundraise for your student organization and i hope they were great i think they were great i was super excited about this episode and giving out this information because this information definitely um, helped me as I was a leader within my organization to raise money for our chapter. But before I let you go, as I've been doing with my individual episodes, I have a challenge of the week I would love for you to participate in. So let's get into it. The challenge of this week 
is first for any student who is a part of a student organization, whether you are a leader or a member, I challenge you to at least brainstorm how your student or organization can focus on one of these ways of fundraising. And just to give a little recap of these five ways, number one, hosting food or um, item sale. So whether it's food, whether it's bracelets or whatever it is, um, hosting sales on your, at your college, um, number two, oh, that's number two. Number one is fundraising with local restaurants or stores where they donate a portion of their sales. Number two is hosting food or item sales. Number three is raffles and tournaments. Number five, four, number four is university and or college grants. And number five is alumni donations. So definitely look over those five things and figure out what can, what your organization might have the best fit for, might be the best fit for, because not everything works for everyone. Um, so this can be the beginning steps of a fundraising campaign that can be for this semester, can be for the next semester or for next school year. Like I said, uh, with that last one, you might have to start at the end uh, with the alumni donations and with the potential company sponsorship from your alumni, um, you might have to start at the end of the year and focusing on the next school year. And then second, if you are not a part of a student organization, but know someone who is, I challenge you to either share this episode with them or give them these ideas so they can fundraise and have a better chance of raising money for their student organization. I don't care. You can take these ideas for yourself. I just want to put it out there so they can be successful. So you can be successful at f fundraising and raising money for your student org organization, because that is definitely a skill to have because everywhere you go, people are trying to raise money, whether it's a, a business, a start, a startup business, whether it's uh, another nonprofit organization, because I'm a part of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Indiana, and they're always doing fundraisers, and they're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, whether it's for, I mean, a trip for a college student trying to go to uh, a conference or go to somewhere they haven't been or out of the country or something like that. Definitely these are transferable skills to have. So like I say, if you aren't a college student, these are skills you can use for your future. So again, thank you for listening to yet another, I hope great episode of the last and be experienced podcast. I really hope you're able to gain something from it to help you along your journey. If you like this episode or help, like what you heard today, please like, share, comment, and subscribe so I know you're listening and enjoying the content. If you have questions, if you have comments or topic ideas or guest ideas, uh, don't hesitate to email me at lazenbeexperience at gmail.com. Lastly, I do want to let you know seasons one and two are also available on all platforms you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts at the Lads and Be Experience Podcast. So definitely check out those two seasons as well. Lastly, lastly, if you are a reader or if you like to read, um, have a written copy of what I've talked about today because maybe you didn't take notes like I like I suggested you did at the beginning of the episode which is fine you don't have to listen to me so you can have it written somewhere already and that's on my blog and it covers every individual episode that I will be talking about um, this season as well as season two so you have a lot of episodes you can get into and then there are also bonus episodes or not episodes bonus 
post that I've written before I even started a podcast. So all of that is there for you at lazenbeexperience.wordpress.com. Again, my blog is lazenbeexperience at wordpress.com. Again, I really hope you enjoyed this episode and was able to gain a lot of information from it. And as always, until next time, continue your journey until you reach your success. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode of the Lazen B Experience podcast. I really hope you were able to receive valuable information that will help you take actionable steps to get you closer to achieving your goals. If this is true for you, I would really appreciate it if you share this episode with others, comment your thoughts, and subscribe to continue receiving updates on new episodes. I truly am excited about how my experience, the Lazenby Experience, can make a difference in your life. Again, thank you for listening to the Lazenby Experience podcast. And until next time, continue your journey until you reach your success.